chapter. Mark chapter 1. And um, just kind of set the context of it. I'm going to go back and read verse 4. And then we'll go down and read verses 7 through 11. John, the baptizer, appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Then going down to verse 7. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, than I, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, Immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Our message this morning is coming from Acts in the 10th chapter. And so as we hear these words, Acts chapter 10, beginning of verse 34. This is Peter's fourth <coughs> message, his fourth sermon in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, beginning of verse 34. Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all of Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. Now God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. In thinking about this passage, I want to begin at the end of the passage. And um, it really is the foundation for Peter's sermon. As Peter is declaring that Jesus, the Christ, is Lord of all. Yesterday, we celebrated the day of Epiphany. We're in now the season of Epiphany. It is the manifestation. It is the aha. It is the realizations of who Jesus is. And the evidence for who he is, Peter gives in this message at the end of the message. God has anointed him with the Holy Spirit. God has anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. All the Gospels declare that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus as he came up from the water like a dove. It descended upon him at his baptism. In Matthew, it says the Holy Spirit rested on him. In John, it says, and it remained on him. And John said, he who sent me said to me, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. God not only baptized him in that moment with the Holy Spirit, God anointed his ministry with power. So we think back at Isaiah in chapter 42, what it was talking about. As Jesus came into his ministry, it would be a ministry of power. He would set free prisoners. He would heal. He would do miraculous things. Peter in his sermon says, he went about doing good. 
Now, <coughs> Peter means this more than Jesus was a nice guy. If you think about the stories of Jesus, you remember there was a young man who came to him and said, good rabbi. I mean, good was not used like, oh, lunch is going to be good today. Good, Jesus says to him, only the Father is good. So Jesus went about doing good. Doing all the things of God the Father. Everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus did came from the Father. It was perfect. It was right. It was true. It was good. And it says that he healed all who were <coughs> oppressed by the devil. As Jesus touched them or as they touched him, their lives were transformed. There was no one who came in contact with Jesus, who truly came in contact with him, who walked away being the same that they were before they interacted with Jesus. Their lives were changed. It was something that went down into them and changed them from the inside out. It, it was a powerful thing. And as we, you would continue, if you want to keep looking there in Acts, as Peter keeps going on with his, his sermon, he says that he was crucified, and on the third day, God raised him from the dead. God has anointed him with the Holy Spirit. God has given him power, his own power, the power of God the Father, and he has raised him from death. He has conquered death. No longer does death hold dominion over us. We, we were talking just briefly before um, everybody started getting here, before Sunday school and stuff. And, and uh, I won't say who said this, and, uh, but we were talking about people uh, who get sick and, and so often, and we, we see this just has become more pronounced since COVID. People that just think you get a cold and it's, it's like death. I mean, they're fearful. They're worried. They're just like, oh, woe is me. I got a cold. Maybe I'm going to die. For the Christian, death holds no dominion. I mean, I'm not looking to die today or tomorrow. But as Paul says to the Philippians, if I were to die, it's gain. I'll be with God. Death holds no dominion over those whose lives are given to Jesus Christ because he was raised from the dead. And we have the promise of life everlasting because of Jesus. We have no fear of anything that could happen in our lives. I mean, it doesn't go be, mean go be stupid. But we do not fear what may happen because Jesus has conquered it all. And we came through the Advent season. What was the last Sunday of Advent? What, what was our theme in the O Antiphons? Emmanuel, which means and what does Peter say about Jesus? God was with him. God was present. Because Jesus is God. He is fully human. He is fully divine as well. God resided within him. 
These are wonderful things. These are the, the foundation, the focus of, of orthodox Christian belief. I don't mean orthodox like in Greek orthodox. I mean orthodox as in right thinking. That's what the word ortho, ortho means right. Dox, doxology means the statements of faith. So the orthodox Christian faith. Hold all of these things to be true. They are the foundation of every denomination's confessions or their articles of faith. They're the things that compose that the apostles came together and, and, and created into the Apostles' Creed, to the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed. These things you cannot not believe and be Christian. These are the foundational <laughs> truths. Now I said we were looking at the end first. And if all that is so important, why didn't Peter begin with the end? I mean, how many people do you know when you've told them the truth have ignored it? A lot of people do. Because unless it really has personal impact to them, They'll say, particularly in our culture today, that's your truth. Not necessarily my truth. So Peter didn't start with that. Peter started out with a personal, profound statement. <coughs> God has no partiality. Now, that is a profound statement for a Jew. See, Peter has grown up all of his life that there are some people that are God's chosen people, and then there's all other people. There are some things that are the right way to do things as a Jew, and then there are the things that aren't right to do. There are the things that you should eat, the things that you shouldn't eat. And Peter is coming to a realization, if you go back into the earlier part of this chapter, you'll see that Peter had a vision. He'd gone up on a roof to pray, and while he was praying, he got hungry, and he, a trance came over him, a vision came over him, cloth came down in front of him that was filled with foods. All kinds of foods. And he was told, eat. I mean, I don't know, it doesn't tell us what literally was on there, but if I had to do some eisegesis, which would be to read into the text, I'd say there was shrimp, and it was lobster, and it was fried catfish, and there was and and Ben had put a roasted pork butt on there, and and there were some spare ribs. Um, well, I shouldn't say spare; they're not leftover extras. They're just going to be good ribs. Um, I mean, there was there was all kinds of things like that. And there were things that a Jew was not allowed to eat. And the Lord tells him, eat. And Peter says, oh Lord, no, no, no. I have never eaten any of these unclean things. I've been a good Jew all my life. And the Lord looks at him. And I can imagine this because I remember sitting on top of the monkey bars in El Alto, Guadalupe, San Jose, and the Lord telling me something. And I said, but Lord, what does that mean about this? And the Lord said, did I say anything about that? Do you need that? Uh, no, Lord. The Lord looks at Peter and says, 
I said, eat. If I declare it clean, it is clean. <coughs> From this vision, Peter realizes, because he comes down and there is a Greek who wants Peter to come and explain to him about the gospel. And Peter goes, aha, a Greek's down here wanting me to explain about the gospel. God has just told me that all things that I send to you are clean. God is without partiality. God does not pay attention to nationality. He does not play, pay attention to how much mo, mo, melatonin is in one's skin. God doesn't pay attention to what one's uh, line item is on the IRS income tax statement. He doesn't pay attention to what one's job status is. God is for all people. And the gospel that Jesus was proclaiming, a gospel that would bring peace, shalom, rightness with God and rightness with all people, has no partiality. That's good news. How many Jews do we have in the room? None. That means God's word is for you. Everything that God is saying and doing is for you. Peter came to understand that whoever accepts Jesus as Savior, whoever follows him as Lord, receives forgiveness, cleansing, and reconciliation for their sins. Now this good news began to be proclaimed after Jesus was baptized. We describe baptism as the outward sign of the inward work of grace. In and of itself, it doesn't matter whether I use this much water or that much water. It won't make a difference on the baptism. The fact that a person gets <laughs> baptized in and of itself is not meritorious. In other words, I can't say I've got a ticket to heaven because I've got a baptismal certificate. <laughs> there is nothing that we do that is meritorious for our salvation. Our salvation comes by the grace of God. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be baptized. But it's saying the amount of water that's used or the fact that we did it doesn't seal us for a promise that we are guaranteed we now have a ticket into heaven. We need baptism. God does not need our baptism. We need it because it, it is our confession that I need to die and I need to rise again in Jesus Christ. I need to be covered by the grace of God. It becomes our expression. So even for a child, for Mason and Travis and any other that their parents can tell them, you were covered by the grace of God. God has promised his grace over your life. Live up to it.
Live up to it. God has promised his grace for you. He will help you. He will be present <laughs> with you all of your life. And we declare that promise in your baptism. Live up to it. God's grace is present for you. That grace is present when we come to that point and say, Lord, I am a wretched sinner. I need your grace to forgive me and cleanse me and save me. We need that grace that will continue to work in us from the inside out by the filling of the Holy Spirit to sanctify us to rid out every cobweb of our lives until we come to glorification. So what happens in baptism? The person is set before God within the body of Christ. The grace of God is manifested by Jesus in his baptism and declared to be present in that person. Just as the Father said to Jesus, so the Father says to you and I, you are my beloved child. The grace of God that was manifested in Jesus on Calvary is present through our faith in him. It is administered to us through baptism. It says, this is the faith that I will follow. The grace of God that anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit is promised to us. So we also may be anointed with the Holy Spirit and we may live a life of power. Amen. Jesus said to his disciples, you will do even greater things than I have done. The power that was present in and through Jesus Christ is promised to you and I. And the baptism proclaims that promise. We are able to receive that filling of the Holy Spirit in our own lives as well. So from now on, whenever a person is confronted by temptation or oppressed by a sense of sin or judgment, when the devil comes around and says, you know, I remember that thing you did way back then and you're really not all that good of a person. We say to Satan, Baptizia Soon, I was baptized. The grace of God has been promised within me. I am his beloved son. I am covered by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come into my life to change me. I was baptized. Get out of here, Satan. Amen. We do not live with him anymore. Jesus came in his power to rid all those who were oppressed by the devil. So a little bit later and we do the service, you'll be invited if you have been baptized to come up and touch the water and remember, I was baptized. It is still present in me. I'm going to continue to live in that promise. It's not just a past thing for me. It is a present reality. The was is not done and over with. The was is now and ongoing. This is good news. The grace of God brings peace into our life that we may have rightness with God. <coughs> For God so loved the world 
whoever believes any person of any land, any people group, whoever reveres, that's what it means here as Peter is saying, whoever fears, it's whoever reveres, whoever believes, whoever trusts and obey in Jesus as the Son of God and will follow him will have life in God now and for eternity. The baptism proclaimed by John the baptizer manifested by Jesus Christ is now the sign of the grace that's available for you and I to live in. May we give praise to God for his grace to us and to all people through Jesus Christ. If you'll take your hymnal and turn to number 741, I invite you to join with me as we sing, Come, Holy Spirit, Dove Divine. May this prepare our hearts and minds to thinking about and participating in the baptism. Number 741. You'll stand with me if you're able. of Jesus you revealed him to be your son and your Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove grant that we who are born again by water in the spirit may be faithful as your adopted children through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God now and forever Amen Baptism signifies God's grace by burial with Christ into his death and resurrection with him to newness of life. We confess the covenant of grace through baptism as acknowledgement of what God has done and is doing and even will do. 
affirmation of Jesus Christ as the Savior, renouncement of all forces of evil, and commitment to serve God faithfully through his holy church. Those who have expressed a desire to be baptized now come forward. We thought we were going to have two that were going to be baptized this morning, but one was not able to be here. So we have one who is going to come and join us. And for all the rest of you, if you have been baptized, I ask you to join in this confession as an expression of your renewal. So all the attention doesn't go on just Crystal. It goes on all of us as we listen to these. But she's going to lead us. I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. I know the last time you had a bunch of these questions was probably when you got married and you had to say, I do, I do, I do. So this is time you're going to say, I do, I do, I do again. Until the last one when I'll ask you to say, I will. Um, so as you'll think about these. Do you here, in the presence of God and his church, acknowledge God's covenant declared at your baptism and recommit yourself now to it? If so, now and afterwards, say, I do. I do. do you renounce all temptations, forces of wickedness, and practices of rebellion against God? I do. do you accept 